keynote speaker for the day and we have madhavan who is the session chair so over to you madhavan to introduce hal and take the session forward uh thank you sonia so it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to introduce hal ebelson who is a professor of computer science at mit so he is one of the giants of computer education over the years many of us know him as the co-author of the book structure and interpretation of computer programs with jerel sussman but before that he also created the first implementation of logo on the apple 2 system he has been a stalwart of the free software movement he has been on the served on the board of the free software foundation and uh, today he is going to talk about his work on the app inventor project at google of which one of he is one of the project leaders he has been widely recognized for his a uh, role in computing education so he has the 2011 carl v karlstrom outstanding educator award from acm and the 2012 award for outstanding contribution to computer science education by acm 60 e. so welcome hal and over to you thank you madam for the introduction and thank everybody who's coming i am really delighted to be talking at a conference about computational thinking in schools because that's exactly what i want to talk about i'm going to first give you a very uh, personal view of how i got started in computational thinking and then say a little bit about what our what our mit app inventor project is doing in that area and then go on and talk about the future and what i think is important next slide so i arrived at mit in 1969 and i was tremendously fortunate to run into professor Seymour Papert who was a mathematics professor and Papert it, it's such a a disaster that he's he's been gone for 15 years now but he really is the person who i think is the spark that's become everything we're talking about in computational thinking the implementer the theorist the wonderful teacher it's really very very much up to him Next slide. And soon after I arrived, he published this miraculous paper. I think this really is the genesis of this of our uh, interest in computational thinking. Right, it's an artificial intelligence laboratory memo, teaching children thinking, 1971. Next slide. And it began saying. This is about presenting a grander vision of educational technology. Notice remember 1971 the idea of computers in education was very much for either administrative rules or grading exams or multiple choice questions and Papert would say I have a grander vision about computer technology something children themselves will learn to manipulate and extend. thereby gaining a greater and more articulate mastery of the power of applied knowledge and a self-confidently realistic image of themselves as creators i mean we kind of take that for granted now but this is not what computers and education were about in 1971 next slide right notice what he said children becoming getting a self confidently realistic image of themselves as intellectual agents that was the start of the MIT logo project next slide that went through the 70s and we had the model our motto was computers are for kids and again that sounds uh trivial now but i can assure you that 1970s computers were for the military and computers were for giant industries but and the fact that there were a, a number of crazy people at MIT saying computers are for kids no one even bothered us very much because they thought it was such a crazy idea next slide and papert published a book i hope everybody gets a chance to look at this book there's a new edition now but the original one mindstorms came out in 1980 and it was about this vision and what you see on there the picture that uh that Miriam the little girl is, is playing with is one of the first logo 
turtles. If you've done computer things, you probably have seen a phrase of doing something with a turtle. This is where this is where it comes from. This was the this was the first one that kids could actually play with. So please, if you get a chance, read Mindstorms. Right? It's 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 a little bit crazy that you hear a book about technology that what's now you know 40 years old almost and is still a still a relevant vision. So please read it. And what we said when we were working through the 70s, because computers were million dollar devices, we said, if computers were only, oh, $10,000, that would change education. You see how naive we were. But in the meantime, the personal computer was coming on board. Next slide. And we implemented logo for the Apple II, logo for the Texas Instruments 99.4. And it was first the first time when, when we said, gosh, kids could be able to get individual access to computers. It's the first time that became real. So we put logo, we, we put logo on the Apple II and it started spreading. And I think many people who are professionals today got their first look at even computing from logo on the Apple II. It's something we're very, very proud of at MIT. Next slide. So after that, I started, I started working with my colleague, Jerry Sussman and his wife, Julie, on what became MIT's main introductory computer course. It started in about 1981 and was that for 12 or 13 years. And the philosophy of that course was directly inspired by Papert's vision and his ideas of computational thinking. If you, if you just read the quote from our preface, right? It says, computing is a revolution in the way we think and the way we express what we think and only incidentally about getting these uh, computer devices to do things. And that was a, a very, that, that was just, just a very different way of articulating, in this case for college freshmen, what, what this whole area is about. Uh, one of those college freshmen, next slide, at MIT, was Jeanette Wing, a freshman then, who took our course called Jeanette Wing, called, uh, our, who took our course, Jeanette Wing, uh, she has since been head of the department at Carnegie Mellon University. Today, she's vice president of research at, Mac, at Microsoft. And when she wrote that, she was head of the computer information science division at the National Science Foundation, 2006. And she wrote what became a very, very influential paper called Computational Thinking and presented the idea that I guess is even radical today, that computational thinking and learning about computers are a universally applicable skill set that everyone, not just computer scientists, should be eager to learn. This was pretty much ignored. Only the computer scientists saw it. But since then, and I think you all know, since then, since 2006, this idea of computational thinking has become more and more and more appropriate. And while not everyone believes today that everyone should learn computational thinking, it's pretty widespread belief that learning about computers, even in uh, primary school, is important and you all, you are the ones who are making that happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, computational thinking, next slide. Yeah, what, what's that about? We think about, you know, the ideas and computational thinking. We say, we say it's about, it's about these important, powerful ideas. Um, you know, they're, they're ideas like, ne next slide. 
like rare life sequences, next slide, events, loops, next slide, parallelism, right? conditionals, all the things that we talk about when we say we're talking about computing. All right, data, next slide. Operators, next slide. Next slide, right? Iteration, all these ideas, next slide, recursion, next slide, and next slide, right? And one more, one, next slide, one more, and then one more. And this is what we are thinking about when we're teaching computational thinking. And what I wanna say is, next slide, that this might be missing a key point. So this focus on, let's call it the mechanics of the vocabulary of using computers might be missing a key point. Right, next slide. Right, let's go back to Papert. What did Papert say in 1971? What was it about? He didn't say it was about conditionals. And he didn't say it was about sequences, right? He said it's about giving people a greater and more articulate mastery of the world. And self-confidently realistic images of themselves as intellectual agents. So I don't talk so much right now about computational thinking. Ne next slide. Because that... It's wonderful stuff, but it might be missing the most important point. What I like to talk about, next slide, is computational action. What's computational action? Right, next slide. Right. Using the power of computing to make a meaningful societal impact. Right, it's about kids being able to actually do things with this power. Give me one second here. Okay. What do I mean by that? One of the one of the consequences of this wonderful uh, technology structure we have, both both the computers and the networks, is that kids, right, even young kids can now do things that actually have consequence in the world, both of their world, their family's world, uh, maybe even some, some of their country. Let me give you an example, next slide. Right, do you skip one? Oh. Right, so let me say more about computational action. There are two pieces of it. One is we call computational identity. And that's being able to situate what you're doing in a context that are personally relevant. And then the, the other one's called digital empowerment, which is you, kids can really see themselves as change agents, that they can use this technology, not just be consumers of it. Let's try next slide. Okay. So let me give you an example. So Dharavi is out, outside of Mumbai. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know, it's one of the largest slums in India. And, uh, right, next slide. Right, it's got about a million people in it. Next slide. Right, the next slide. Okay, so Dharavi is home to about a million people. I, I think the average income is about $50 a month. You, if I'm not right, you, you can find that better than, better than I can. And next slide. All right, and Dharavi is also home to the Darvi Code Girls, who's a group of girls who are by about ages 12 to 16. The Darvi Girls for Change, next slide. 
right? And what they do is they apply technology and in particular are making, making apps to things that will help their community. Next slide. Right, so one of the examples is they have an application that they call Pani that schedules your family's time at, at, the, at the community water, water collection site, right? And that way you don't have to fight over it, it's scheduled. Uh, of course, the girls see this very, very personally because they were the ones who the family sent to the water collection site and had to stand there and possibly in there in the argument. So they see that very, very personally, but they also see that as, they also see that as an example of them using that technology to make the world better. Not in the future, not in the job, not that they wanna think about a job and all that, but making it better now. Right? That's an example of computational action. Next slide. Right? And what Pani demonstrates as computational action is that even children in the poorest communities can start using this technology to improve life for the people around them. Next slide. So Moldova is a country between Russia and Romania, right? One of, the, one, of the, one of the things in Moldova is that they have a large hepatitis problem and there's lots of instances of bad water, right? So another group, next slide, of I think, I think six high school girls have created an app to help their country, help them find sources of pure water. And the way it works in the app is you go to this water source, you take, you take a picture of that source with your mobile phone. You fill out a little questionnaire saying, what's the water like? Is it available? Is it good? Is it not? And then that goes on a database, on a map, on a Google map that's accessible throughout Moldova, actually probably throughout the world. And so with the consequence, is that anybody traveling around in Moldova can look at this thing and say, where are the sources of pure water? Okay. Next slide. All right, so think about that as a national resource that was created by a couple of high school girls as a project. This is the kind of thing that is possible now with technology. Next slide. Right? Even children can create valuable resources that have nationwide scope. Right? I mean, think about that. As you're, as you're teaching about computational thinking and computational action, think about your kids as initiators of change that can have a national impact. It really happens. It's really true now. Next slide. So let me let me go from from let me go from Eastern Europe and India to uh, the U.S., where a group of middle school kids, middle school girls, developed an app to help the grandfather of one of those girls who's having Alzheimer's, and she wanted to do something to help somebody who has dementia, and what she produced is actually very, very simple. It's a to-do list that reminds you when to take your medication. So as an app, that's, that's very simple technically, right? And your, your students should be able to do that. But think about what that means to her and to her classmates. She was being very personal and she said, I made this app as a tribute to my grandfather and not only that, as something that would help, would help all kinds of elderly people who are having problems with dementia. And again, in honor of my grandfather. Next slide. Right. 
that app's called Farm Alarm. And it says that children can draw on their personal experience as an inspiration to make life better for, for others. Again, so it's not only distant national stuff, you can make a link between kids' own experience and use that as inspiration for using you know, the power of technology to make something better. Uh, next slide. Here's a similar one from a middle school in Hong Kong. And, and again, there's a lot of concern in Hong Kong about, uh, about the elderly and dementia patients. And kids are very, very much into that too in Hong Kong. And here's another app made by a middle school class in Hong Kong, right? That's, that's really for dementia paper, patients and caregivers. And it has the kind of stuff that you would, might expect should be on it. And the kids implemented all of this. There's alarms, there's a button that says, where am I if I'm lost? There are tips to caregivers, there are exercise games to test, test physical and mental functions. And then there's this very, a um, very cool thing. Um, next slide. That the messages on this thing come at, in the voices of your family members. All right. So you're an elderly person. You want help with this app, and you hear, you know, your your kid, your your granddaughter or your daughter actually in her voice saying what the message is. Um, I can tell you, I never in a million years would have thought of that, right? We all know about putting alarms and locator functions and caregiver tips, but I would never have thought of actually doing that in the voices of the family members. It's just a marvelous example of how, just a marvelous example about how kids, when you look at this technology through the eyes of kids, you see new possibilities and new great things to do. And so another thing when you're doing with your students, think about how they can be leading you to see the new possibilities of this technology. You know, as you're inspiring them, they can inspire you. Next slide. All right, so again, there's this another example of computational action, right? It's, again, these are middle school students. They can use their skills to improve the quality of life for family members and be inspired by that. Next slide. So here is, here's Gitanjali, Gitanjali Rao, who made a wonderful app called Tess. You know, there's this, there was this awful thing in the US in Flint, Michigan, where there was lead poisoning in the water. So again, Gitanjali, who was, I think, 15 at this time, SWAT TV reports on that and got very inspired and said, why can't I make something that tests air quality? Next slide. And And it's got a sensor on it, a very simple sensor. And it's hooked to an app. And she put this out, it got a lot of publicity. And it detects hazardous gases in the water. And here she got actually got a lot of fame from this and went on the on the Jimmy Fallon show in 2018. And here she is explaining to Jimmy Fallon where it comes and then it actually hooks from an app. And I created this custom app with using MIT app engineer for Android phone. And Jimmy Fallon says, you're 12 years old. Just, just sort of this sense of amazement that these kinds of contributions can come from young kids. Next slide. Right? And then, you know, that was when she was 12. Now she's all, she, now she's all grown up. She's 15. And she actually got chosen as kid of the year by Time Magazine. So it's an example. We, we at MIT are just insanely, insanely proud of her. 
But it's an example of, again, it's about looking at the technology that we're also interested in as sources of empowerment and sources of empowerment of, of empowering kids to actually make a better world. We all talk about making a better world for kids and things, but how about making it so kids can make a better world? And it doesn't have to be a better world 20 years from now or 10 years from now or five years from now when they go to college. It can be now. Right, kids in middle school, kids in high school. We're even doing some things in Appenvenner with kids in primary school. This is immediate now kind of opportunity. Okay. Next slide. So the way you use this is we run a server at MIT that allows does anybody in the world to uh, connect to it and create and create these apps and then download them to tablets and mobile phones and run things? We have about a million users a month, a million active users a month, about a hundred thousand active users a day. Actually, that was last year. It's about it's about the same now. It wasn't affected all that much by the pandemic. And there you can see the main countries that are using it, right? Topper, US, Mexico, South Korea, and Taiwan, which are all very, very big. Uh, India, India is somewhat lower. I'm a little surprised by that. When we ran a content, when we ran a contest in July on making apps, India was by far the largest number of users. So there's a lot of, in, a lot of really interesting stuff that's happening in India happening with your kids. You know, you're having a real impact on the global progress of this kind of education. And one of the countries you don't see there is China, because you can't get to log into our MIT server from behind the Chinese Great Firewall. Next, next slide. So in fact, we have a arrangement with the uh, municipal government in Guangzhou that they are mounting a clone of our MIT server and they've got about 300,000 users in China, which is really <laughs> enormously small for China, but uh, there's a lot of other interest happening. Okay, next slide. We ran a, a hack, we run a hackathon in July. This one shows you from, from not, not the one a couple of months ago, but the one a year ago. And it's about asking people, any people, whether kids or not, we have we have users, we have had entries in here from age four to age 84. But it's like it's asking people to do things and submit things that really deal with societal problems. Right? We have about we had and they have to do they have to do something in a week, July 12th to 18th. And uh, we got about a thousand entries and it's just wonderful. And, and as I mentioned, I think the largest country for entries was India. And uh, it's just wonderful to see the kinds of ideas people have and the fact that they can actually implement them. Next slide. There, there's a graph you can see, uh, yeah, 1103 registrations. India as the top country putting things in. So I don't have to tell you, just look around with what you're doing with your students. There's enormous energy. There's enormous talent. So you right now, today, right, are in the super position, maybe the best in the world to make this global change, to really get people to think less about uh, standard meanings of, uh, words in computing languages and think more about what can I do with it? How can I have the impact, right? Not, not how can I have the impact if I go to university and get a job and do something, but how can I, right, as a student in primary school, do something that makes a difference? These, these results from our hackathon demonstrate that. Okay, next slide. So that's 
thinking about computational action today. That's today. Tomorrow. Next slide. As you all know, we're entering this new age of artificial intelligence. And what's interesting to me about this, next slide, is I started talking about Seymour Papert. The other thing that Seymour Papert was doing at MIT when he was initiating the logo project and initiating basically everything we're doing in computational thinking. But he was also at the same time, next slide, working with Marvin Minsky to direct the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. And here you see a quote from their progress report to, uh, to the government in 1972 that says what we're doing is we're talking about combining technical progress with a point of view about the theory of intelligence. Technical progress in making machines and robots and do things with really thinking about, about thinking. Next slide. And I talked about the logo project. There's a logo. There, there's there's a logo project again. The one on the yellow, by the way, is the very, very, very first turtle, logo turtle. And it was the very, very best because the kids in first grade could ride on it. We're only right now getting back in robotics where we think about stuff that the kids actually can physically interact with. But in any case, that's, that's the first, that, that's the first turtle, turtle. And that's what we were saying in the 70s when we said computers are for kids. But in fact, next slide. Right, many of the researchers in the MIT AI lab in the 70s the ones who were sort of you know, creating the foundations of artificial intelligence. And at the same time, they were exploring this idea of computers for kids. And I really believe that that might be why our area is called, area of education is called computational thinking, because there was such a focus coming from the research group, because the graduate students and the staff members who were thinking about the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. At the same time, you know, we were bringing groups of kids in the lab and having them program in Logo. Maybe there was such a focus on thinking. I, that might be why the, why the name, this name computational thinking has survived. It might be why, why what you're doing is called computational thinking, but that, that's just speculation. Uh, next slide. Right. So now I just said there's a shift. We're entering this age of artificial intelligence. And now the question is, as teachers, what's important? What have we been doing that maybe is not so important? And what's the new stuff happening? Right. Next slide. Right. It's again critical thinking, creativity, social skills ethical judgment, that's going to be future success. So we certainly want our, our, our students to, to learn about that and do that. Next slide. Right. And there are two key ideas I want to talk about that basically are missing from the instruction we're doing around computational thinking. I mean, some people are doing them, but basically when you have lists of what should be covered, that's these, these tend not to be here. So next slide. The first one are statistical methods. So when we talk about machine learning and neural nets and all of this stuff, there's a big use of probability and statistics and getting students to understand how that works. Let me give you my, my uh, simplest possible that I know explanation of machine learning. Right. Next slide. 
let's suppose we want to make a machine that is going to look at a picture of a dog and predict whether the dog will bite. Okay, that's our, that's our AI neural network machine learning kind of machine. But let's make it so that, so it's really easy to understand what's going on. So you start with a group of experts who are supposed to determine whether a dog will bite or not and have them vote. Next slide. And their votes have weights. So that top blue one, uh, if they vote yes, that's one, it's worth 1.1. 1 .1. And the bottom uh, red one, if they vote yes, is worth 0 0.7, but the, vo the votes are weighted. Okay, and now if you wanna run this machine, next slide, right? You show these experts the pic a picture of a dog and you say, is this dog gonna bite? And then each one kind of says yes or no. So the blue one thinks no, and the red one thinks no, and the, the yellow one thinks yes. So you take their votes with their weights and you tally them up. So here you get a tally of 4.5 no, 3.05 yes, and your machine overall says, yeah, the dog will bite. Okay, next slide. Now, you go to somebody who really knows whether or not those answers were correct. So-called supervisory learning. Someone says, I looked at what the expert said. I know which, what was the right answer for the dog. Uh, the blue one on top voted no, but in fact, the dog bit. So the blue one was wrong. So you, in, so you decrease the weight on the blue one a little bit from 1.1 votes to 1.0 votes. Okay, and next slide, All right? So in general, you increase the weights from the experts who answered correctly and you decrease a little bit from the ones who got it wrong. Okay, next slide. Now you find, you go show these experts another dog and you ask the same question. Who thinks the dog's gonna bite? Who thinks the dog's not gonna bite? Well, the experts vote again. You have a tally again and you do, you do the same thing. Next slide, right? You take the, you see which ones were correct and which ones were incorrect and you modify the weights a little bit. You give more weight to the ones that were correct and take a little away from the ones that were incorrect. Next slide. Right? And you keep going and now you go again and now you show it another, another dog. Okay, and do the same thing. Next slide. Okay. And you keep doing this over and over and over again. And the idea is when you, when you, trained this machine on many, many dogs, it tends to give good answers. That's called, that, what, what I mean to say is it, it tends to give good answers, not only for the particular dogs you've shown it, but kind of for any dog. That's called generalization. And the idea in machine learning is if you show it enough examples and correct examples, then it generalizes. Right, so it can answer things not only about the particular examples you showed it, but about anything. Next slide. So to say this in a little bit more traditional notation of the kind you, you might see in a course on machine learning, right? We've, we've made a neural network dog bite predictor. And it works just like I, like I, like I said, each what's called neurons at the end have a weight, they say plus or minus one for yes or no. All those plus or minus ones are multiplied by their weights, added together and put into a, a, sum, a summation. And then you check whether the sum of all those things is positive or negative. And that's the answer you do. Okay, so, right, so you've just seen, you, you've just seen an example of 
basically how machine learning works. Next slide. Right. So to say it in a little bit more firm, more formally, those pictures of dogs are what we would call training data. So you will hear about machines being trained. That's what's going on. Um, each expert might be doing a somewhat different thing, but uh, at the end you have a lot of them who are looking at different at, di at different stuff. Some of them some of them might be looking at the dog's eyes. Some of them might be looking at colors. Some of them might be doing all sorts of things. But you get a lot of them. And then in this particular method, as you train each example, we have to know whether the dog really did bite or not. That's called the gold standard. We knew what the real answer is that we're training again, and that's called supervised learning. So you'll hear a lot when you hear about machine, machine learning about supervised learning. This is what it is. So what could go wrong with this? Next slide. Right. Well, I didn't show you a lot of examples, but the ones I did, all the nice dogs, all the non-biting dogs had solid color faces. And the mean dogs that were biting were a mixture of brown and white. And imagine I had a whole, you know, a thousand examples and they all had that. That would mean that my expert who only looked at whether a dog's face was uh, brown and white or solid color would be very accurate using that for prediction. So what does that mean? That means when we did the supervised learning, we'd say, oh gosh, this expert is right and right and right. And we'd increase their, the weight of their vote very, very much, right? So this thing, because, because the data is not good, we can build a machine that really, really does the wrong answers. And the problem is we don't have enough and I should say the problem in general, when you hear, see about this in industry, is that you don't have enough training data or that the training data is biased in a way that makes the expert look better than it really deserves. So this is super, super common in machine learning coming out. It's called training bias. And it's one of the things that, that we, need, we need to look at in terms of these, in terms of these, these networks in terms of these machine learning neural networks things, ending up with bad data and even data that can have bad societal consequences. Next slide. So the next thing that's largely missing when we talk about computational thinking is the real societal impact of this stuff. Because one of the consequences of this incredible technology that's going, this great AI technology, is there's, it really matters what these systems are doing. So as somebody who's thinking about building one and somebody who's teaching kids about this, you want them to consider what's the impact of the thing that they might be making or thinking or studying or thinking about make, making. Uh, next slide. Right. So one thing I'm proud of, I'm, a, I'm an advisor to a, a graduate student in the media lab called Joy Bonwini, who in her master's thesis that you're seeing there, just did this breakthrough on facial recognition. And she, she kind of did it because she, she was on a, on a look, looking at some machine, I think in Hong Kong, about facial recognition and doing stuff and went in front of the machine and it didn't even know there was a face there. It's not that they classified her wrong. It, it that didn't recognize that her black face was a face at all. And then what she did is she built a white mask and put on the white mask. And at that point, the system recognized there was a face there. And that was so so striking to her, and so just such a a personal uh, blow, right? This technology that she was working on didn't even recognize that she was a face. So now she's finishing; she's just finishing a PhD about this, 
and in fact is going to be defending that PhD at MIT uh, in two weeks. And is just just going around and talking about it. She was on, uh, I think, Good Morning America, talking about this uh, last week. But uh, just, just an incredible accomplishment. I am so proud to have been part of advising that thesis. It's a real, real impact. Then she went and was studying Amazon's, what they call the recognition system. Next slide. Right, this was a commercial Amazon system that Amazon was selling in 2019. And they tested how good this commercial system that Amazon was selling was with different people. And they found the results that you see that it would really did wonderful on light skinned males. And if you compared that with dark skinned females, it was terrible, right? These are facial, this is facial recognition, right? And what, what, Joy, what Joy and Timnick found out that these systems really, really perform worse or perform better on light skinned males than on other parts of the population. And Amazon sort of said, well, blah, 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 the experiments aren't good and all this stuff. But at the end, I think Amazon has stopped selling this just because what the, the research they did was so compelling and so good. I'll show you another example. Next slide. Right, so here's someone in New Zealand who was denied a passport. Right, actually denied a passport because the passport system said your eyes are closed. Right, so you see these systems are built with enormous bias against the non, against the, the, the major populations where they're being designed. So just, just think about that. That's just one example of a real consequence to somebody from the machine being misdesigned or to go back, mis, you could, we could say mistrained, although there are other reasons bias get into system. But in this case, you can imagine the system being trained and you can imagine the company creating the system and basically they're creating it with pictures of white guys. So one of the things that's happening that I'm sure you know, there's a lot of criticism of facial recognition going on. Next slide. Right, so you're seeing, oh, this is even in the last couple of months, you see places that are now actually banning the use of facial recognition and studying it because, because there's so much, there's so much ability, there's so much opportunity for abuse in this. Right? And people are starting to realize it. And again, it's something that your students should think about also. Because at the end, you're, it's your students that you're empowering to make these things. And shouldn't they, shouldn't they really get used to thinking critically? about the consequences of the things that they would be making. Okay, next slide. Let me, let me, let me just sort of sum up and switch to that. I'm, I'm a member, a bunch of people are members of something called AI for K-12. And you can, you can go look, at, look it up. And what, what our charter is, we're from the Association for the Advancement of Artificial, Artificial Intelligence and the Computer Science Teachers of America. It's a joint project of those, of those two. And what we're supposed to be doing is creating a framework for what should be taught in K through 12. So we're publishing it little, little by little and taking care to get lots and lots of comments on it. You can go to AI, you can go, you can go to AI4K12.org. Next slide. Right? We're trying to make national guidelines. They're divided into four grade bands that you see there, K to two, three to five, six to eight, nine to 12. What should students know? And more than that, what should students be able to do? So there's a bunch of us sitting around scratching our heads saying, what are, what, what's reasonable and what should, you know, what should students six to eight know about machine learning or about data? What should students in kindergarten through age two 
know about oh, interacting with a social robot or things like that. We've, we're developing a curated resource directory that's aimed for teachers. So I don't, I don't think that's published yet, but hopefully that'll be something that will be around for you to look at. And we're trying to foster a community of practice about researchers and teachers. So I hope that takes off. You want to look at that next slide. Right. What that looks like is we've said there are really five big ideas in AI that we want people to know about, right? Perception, right? How to how to add a computers and people process sound and vision and all of that. How does perception work? Representation and reasoning, how does that get translated into something that computers can actually deal with? Learning, which is machine learning like I just hinted at before. Natural interaction, how do we make it so if I'm conversing or interacting with some kind of, some kind of machine or robot or something, that can be natural. And then lastly, and all through this, is societal impact. So this is what our group says are the five big ideas in AI, and we're, we're expanding things along that framework. Okay, next slide, to bring it to an end. Right. I started talking about computational thinking and tried to say, we're now in a world where it's not just thinking about those uh, the, the sort of formal elements of computer programming languages and stuff. It's really about action. It's really about action that your students can do right now. And then went on to say, if we look into the future a little bit, we're going to be in the world of artificial intelligence devices and robots and all kinds of things. So you need to be thinking about AI education. I know many, many, many people are thinking about that now but it's going to become more and more and more. Next slide. Okay, and the thing I'd like to say, the general framework beyond this is that we're, get, we're is increasing empowerment and empowerment for learners. The things that, some of the things I told you about, the AI things that kids can make, make now, would have been impossible for, outside of the largest research labs five years ago. The machine learning things would have been impossible even two years ago. If for those of you who have iPhones, you know you know that you can you can show your right. You can show, you can log into your iPhone by facial recognition. That's running on the phone. Right, right on the phone is doing the facial rec recognition computation. That's only in the last couple of years. And these are now capabilities that your kids can harness. Examples of more impact that they can have that even, you know, that even the world's largest research labs could not have had 10 years ago. So understand that dynamic and get ready to take advantage of it. Next slide. Okay, and remember, for me, it's all about what Papert wrote in 1971. It's giving your kids a greater and more articulate mastery of the world, a sense of the power of applied knowledge, and most importantly, a realistic image of themselves as intellectual agents. That's what this technology can do. Next slide. And there we are, that's the end of the talk. But next slide. It's not the end, right? It's just the beginning of this world that we are entering in which your students can be empowered. And most importantly, that we as teachers can be inspired and empowered. So thank you very much. Thank you, Hal. It's a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. So I think there will be some questions coming. But meanwhile, maybe I'd like to ask you one question myself, Hal. Uh, so 
so there is, of course, what you said is very relevant in terms of teaching kids both the power and the responsibility in some sense, which goes with the power. But unfortunately, as we have seen, it's all too easy to deploy these systems without understanding the consequences. So uh, is there, I mean, so there's kind of a double-edged sword there, right? So you have the power regardless of whether you understand the consequences or not. And that's a little bit uh, difficult to somehow control. Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I consult for Google, which is a good example. And, you know, you have no idea how many people in Google are worried about exactly that. They've made a large division in Google called, it, it's a part of Google brain called responsible AI. And it's got a couple of hundred people in there and they think about exactly the kind of issues that you do. So again, think in terms of Google. If Google brings out a product and there are things wrong with it, or if it's biased or anything, you know, they right. just legal, legally are liable. So there's an enormous thing about that. But, but then what does that mean in terms of educating kids? You want kids to be aware, you want the kids to learn to be, to be critical and to think about those issues you know, not, not only 20 years from now, because they might be, I don't know, designers working for Google, right? They won't be or something, but, but you, want, you want kids to have that kind of ability to question and to be critical. And that's right now, that's even in, in primary school. So it's a thing we should be thinking about a lot. It's a great question. So any other questions anybody would like to ask? I don't see any in the chat yet. A lot of people, of course, are very appreciative of the talk, but no concrete questions that I've seen yet. Uh, may uh, I uh, ask okay. Madhra? Yeah, go, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, when we are talking about computational thinking, um, we're talking about a set of principles which uh, you know children get involved in activities, they understand. Uh, they do. Now, when we talk about using the power of AI technology, especially machine learning, uh, there may be an element of mystery, right? I mean, children use this technology, but they don't really understand what's going on. And uh, so the problem of explanation, especially with children, uh, would that be an issue to think about as we go further? And as the technology, you know, they start using it more and more in their hands. So, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have said that. I, I couldn't have said, said that better myself. It's, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful, very, very important question. When you, and when you talk about children not understanding it, I can tell you that in industry, when you have these large neural, ne neural networks, the developers who are building them don't understand what they're doing. So it's not only about, only about kids. And I don't know how many of you heard the, this buzzword called XAI, right? So XAI stands for explainable AI. And it's a realization by, by everyone, including industry, to whom this has enormous financial co consequences, that people simply are not gonna trust their products if they don't have explanations, some kind of explanations of how they work. So, you know, you're pointing at a, I mean, you're pointing at a major, major thing. Also, uh, you know, a major concern in, in in, in professional industry, in, the, you know, in Google and Facebook and Amazon and all this stuff, there are people who are very worried about XAI. And, you know, and here we are as teachers of primary school students, maybe figure out what's the appropriate message to your primary school students. Like maybe they should want to be able to understand how it works. So I did this very simple, you know, showed, showed you my uh, primary school exposition of how supervised learning works, that's a beginning. But when you talk about more detailed things, uh, what do people, what's an example? Uh, I apply for a bank loan, right? And I'm rejected. And now I'm owed an explanation of why I was rejected. And then somebody says, well, you were rejected because in our neural network of 100,000 neurons, neurons, neuron number 873 said 4.8 and it should have said 5.1. Okay, that's, 
you know, that, that's not an explanation. But sometimes that's what's around. So there's an enormous research being done in this XAI thing, and it's very, very important. Madhavan, you are on mute. Yeah, I had a couple of questions on the chat. So I'll pass oh, them so on in, in the order in which I see them. So the sure. first one is, uh, what is the difference in impact in computational thinking and cognitive skills when learning AI with or without statistics? Okay, well, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a researcher, so I can only speculate. But in this world of, you know, in, in, in this world specifically of machine learning, you're getting out probabilities and estimates. It's a very important difference. So in most of the things where we've been exercising in computing, there's a, there's a computer and it's getting an answer. But when you get into these areas, I mean, anything in machine learning really, but anything that really has societal impact, those, th th those really, really are places where people have to apply judgment, where there's room for argument and then Again, in a classroom, even of young kids, you know, you can easily you can easily imagine, and many people do. It's not whether there's a right or wrong answer; it's having the kids think about the extent to which these answers are right or wrong. And those, I'm, I'm not a researcher, so, right, or a psychologist, but those that's co cognitively very, very, very different. And it's a thing that hasn't been in the computer science class until now very much. And in the future, it's going to be there more and more and more. As the technology has more impact on society, it becomes more important for kids to get exposed to that kind of thinking. Okay, so I'm going to paraphrase the next question a little bit. So it's related to the question that I asked, but in a more pointed way. So we were talking about the, uh, you know, teaching kids about societal impact. So the question is that, but you already have big companies like Google and Facebook, which are exploiting AI for commercial advantage. And so in a sense, it's kind of, the question is that, I mean, is regulations are not in place to guard against, in some sense, the misuse of uh, AI. So how do we cope with that? I mean, is it something right, that so we can- So first of all, I got to be careful. I'm a Google consultant. So I want to make sure that when I say things in the public for, forum, you know, I'm not sort of speaking in terms of Google policy. But I can tell you in this case that Sundar Pichai, who is the head of Google, has said many times that this needs regulation. So Google's real, pol real policy here is, is accepting the fact that regulation is important. And then try, trying to craft the, but that of course doesn't tell you what kind of regulation. So okay. it's, so it, yeah. It's, so that's the question, right? Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. How do you design regulations which, which can capture this and limit this in a sensible way? So anyway, but I agree, it's an open-ended thing, and I don't think we have an answer. But it's good that and, and very and that, very controversial. Yeah, and also, it's, but it's good to hear that the company like Google is consciously pushing for this as a self-limiting exercise. So the next question is, uh, what, what do you think are the role, is the role of AI in designing learning environments? How does it change the learner's relationship with learning? Well, Can we use AI for designing learning environments? Yeah, I mean, of course that's been, gosh, that's been part of the vision since the sixties, you know, starting with how do you, uh, present multiple choice tests on, on these computers in the 60s. There's a lot of work that's going on where people are thinking about that. And they, re and they go all the way from, how do you think about structuring the knowledge so that kids and teachers can access it in a really way? All the way you know, to things that are scary. Like I think you know about the have you seen, seen some of the Chinese things in Shanghai where the kids will wear, wear headbands that, uh, that pick up their EEG things and tell whether they're telling, paying attention or not? Has anybody seen well, that? I haven't seen that. That sounds really scary. 
<laughs> oh, it sounds, sounds really, really scary. <laughs> What's really scary is the parents say, what a wonderful thing, because my kid's paying attention and learning. But, but anyway, there's a whole spectrum there. And, uh, you know, just sort of any kind of automation can be put, can be put to, to helping teachers and do things. There are things like reactions. I mean, at MIT, we have, you know, we have things where if I'm giving a lecture like this, I can get some sense of whether it's getting through to, to everybody here just by, you know, in this case, seeing whether they're looking at, looking at the camera or not, you know, so you can consider that, in, that an AI thing. But there's, there's just lots and lots and lots. It's a giant important application. And, you know, AI and other stuff is very, is very uh, acceptable to that. Okay, so another question, this is a different track. So it goes back to more traditional computational thinking. So if you learn stuff like conditionals, if then else, and so on at an early age, does it somehow restrict your thinking, make it, make it more straight jacketed and kind of force you to think along predictable lines? Is that, is that hampering creativity in some sense? Oh, I mean, I mean what a wonderful question. Right, um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even begin to try to answer that, like, other than hope people actually do this based on data, rather than on prejudice. We all know the, right? We know know the example. Of, you know, the computer nerd, who, uh, the, right? The, the computer nerd who just nothing but, but is not interacting with anyone or not thinking about it. Have you heard? Have you heard the joke about what is an extrovert in computers in computer science? An extrovert is someone that when they're talking to you, they're looking at your shoes rather than their shoes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's all there's all these yeah. ideas about what that does. I'm not going to speculate on that. <laughs> I think there are, lots of, there are lots of effects rather than whether they're learning about conditions or stuff. Okay, so the, the next question is about one of the, I guess, one of the common concerns that many people have uh, in terms of terminology, at least. So the line between AI and dominating natural intelligence, in some sense, is AI kind of hampering, again, in a, it's a different way of asking the same question, is, is AI somehow reducing our natural ability to think? by relying on AI technology? Well, again, I mean, there are lots of opinions all over the place based on very, very little data. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, there's fears about this. Uh, so I don't know how it is in India, but very few people that I know can sort of easily remember their telephone number because AI is taking that, oh, no, the system's taking it over and they're just not using it. Right. I get embarrassed. Somebody asks me what my telephone number is. And like I said, gosh, I, I don't remember my telephone number. And you can imagine AI, you know, doing that in an extreme, extreme way. But so far it hasn't, so far that hasn't happened. And of course, the other side of this is that in AI, the computers will do these mundane tasks and free people to higher level thinking. But you have to, that just might be Pollyanna optimism. It's a very, very, very serious question. Yeah, so speaking of telephone numbers, see, what I find is I can remember numbers from, say, the 1990s when I needed to remember them. I can still remember them. Right. But I can't remember the numbers from the last 10 years when I did not need to remember them. Yeah, because exactly. they were on my phone. So, <laughs> I, uh, so uh, I guess I don't see any more questions in the chat here. Uh, so is there anything else which I've missed? Does anybody see anything which I've missed? Uh, I think Manohar's in Q&A, where he talks about uh, doing this work. In oh, okay. So it was copied wrong in my, on the doc. Okay. So let me see. I mean, he is saying there should be representation of experts from India, China, and Africa in this kind of education work because majority of children live in this oh. part of the world. So 
Uh, US based research can miss a lot of the insights that come from working with children in these Asian countries. I think that is his main comment. And really... Absolutely. Okay, everyone. I mean, thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed talking to a group like this because you are the group that really can make change. I mean, it's partly, it's partly the technology, it's partly the attitudes that people have, but, but also I am completely impressed by how much activity there is in our work from India. There's something really magical happening in this country about that. So please, you are the, you are the ones who can make that happen. So go, go ahead and do that, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, goodbye, thank you very much. Thank you, Hal, for a wonderful session. Yeah, thank you, Hal. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Sonia, I think you should wind up and mention tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. And tomorrow is the last and the final day of CTIS. So please join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. when we have the keynote with Wolfgang. And then we have a couple of feature presentations. And we end with a session on CS Patshala. And we really look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you I so said two much. and not three. I mean, that's a... Pardon me? The two PM it starts at two. PM. Yes, two PM. It starts at two PM tomorrow. Okay. Yes. We'll be there, Sonia. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Madhavan. Yeah. Bye. Bye.